With a vibrant history that is synonymous of Karachi, today we will deliberate the planning, the governance, and the apathy that prevails and are considered the root cause of Karachi's failure, or is it the citizens who have failed the city of Karachi? I would like to just take a few moments to introduce my speakers and moderator, which is none other than architect and planner, Dr. Noman Emmert from NED University, the chairman of the head of the architecture planning department, widely written, done extensive research on the city of Karachi. He is an important voice in the eccentricity that we call uh, Karachi. He has the pulse of Karachi and understands the city very well, has written widely in newspapers, papers, and has presented research which has culminated in many issues that have been addressed for the city. We have amongst us as speakers, Arif Hassan. Arif Hassan needs no introduction, has been with us in the Do You Know Your City prior also, is an important voice that has raised many issues of the city, has conducted many research, has worked with international and local bodies, has been witness to the changes in the bylaws and the master plans of the city of Karachi. Of course, again, Arif Hassan has penned down many books and has uh, conducted many research, which actually are important aspects of Karachi, may, uh, be it history or be it uh, heritage, or the social spectrum and no wonder he's called as the social scientist word coined which aptly sits well with him then we have mr iftikhar shalwani dr iftikhar shalwani who completed his mbbs in 1999 and then further went on to do his masters in regional and urban studies he is an officer who has very recently taken over as the administrator of karachi Prior, he was the commissioner of Karachi and under his leadership, many, many strong initiatives were taken in for the city of Karachi. Last but not the least, we have amongst us Fahim Zama, prior administrator of Karachi, currently with the Dawn Group, one of the leading journalists from the country. His incisive reporting and research especially on Karachi and understanding of the pulse on the ethnicity of Karachi is extremely important. And he has also raised many voices and has created a lot of noise in the right directions for the city of Karachi and for the inhabitants of Karachi. I, uh, without further ado, I would like to pass on the mantle to our moderator of today, Dr. Noman Emma. And from there on, he will be conducting the session. I believe Commissioner Saab is with us. So we'll take this forward. Once again, a very warm welcome from ADA and from Maria Aslam. I hope we have a tremendous evening ahead. On to you, Noman Saab. Thank you very much, Maria. First of all, I thank you and ADA for inviting me and organizing this very useful seminar, which is looking at some of the important issues that Karachi faces today and some of issues it has been facing for a considerable amount of time. Very recently, I believe during the past four to five weeks, discussions about Karachi and its affairs have become very, very prominent in the national discourse. And I take it as a positive sign because now people are focusing more, trying to understand the issues that are wrapped in many, many, I would say, confusions and myths. And possibly the title of today's seminar, which is Urban Myths of Karachi, is, is pertinent in that respect. So my first question to Arif Saab, Arif Hassan Saab, and that refers to a very significant myth that often affects the people of Karachi, a specific segment of Karachi. The myth is that, that the residents of unplanned settlements in Karachi do not pay taxes and utility charges and they are somehow a burden on Karachi's economy. Many, many researchers have proven it to be otherwise, but your vast experience and observations in this respect will be truly useful for this audience. So kindly dilate on this particular matter. First of all, I'd like to know, do I speak in Urdu or English? So primarily we are having it in English, but of course Urdu okay. is very well. No, no, it's okay. If you're having it in English, I'll speak in English. It depends on what you mean by pay taxes. The vast majority of Katiabadi residents have connections of electricity and gas. Those who have these connections have to pay the charges of both of these, otherwise they can't possibly 
continue to have these facilities. Regarding water, the issue is that they would like to pay water and get water. The problem is that they don't get water. Even if they pay the charges, they don't get water. So there is, yes, a very large percentage of Kachi Abadi residents who do not pay for water. Also, there are those who have a kunda for electricity. But that kunda is simply there because, again, they do not have another possibility of getting an electric connection. And those kundas, they have paid a very irregular amount for those kundas to the staff of the KESC, KE now. Similarly, the Kachi Abadi residents are constantly paying some form or other of bhatta. When they move onto a plot, they pay. When they get start building a boundary wall, they pay. When they get an electric or gas connection, they pay. When they lay a roof, they pay. For every step of development that the house takes, the Kachi Abadi resident pays bribes so that he can continue by finishing that activity. Otherwise, he stopped. I calculated, but this was some time ago, that they pay approximately two and a half times more than they would have paid normally for these services over a period of about 15 to 20 years. So, yes, there are some taxes that are not paid, but then you have this additional issue of paying to survive, paying bhatta to survive where they are. And off and on, a few houses are knocked down, and then the entire locality is told that we are going to knock all the houses down unless all of you pay 5,000 rupees or 10,000 rupees so that you can continue to live here. These are common practices. So if you stop taking bhatta, I think they would be very happy to pay even more tax than what they pay today. Yes, Ravan? There's a related question that I want to ask Fahim Saab because he remained uh, the administrator of Karachi at a very crucial moment in uh, Karachi's history. And that relates to the options of regularizing the squatter settlements. What is your take on the whole uh, issue of regularizing Kachi Abadis? Do you think that it is still viable? Can it be done with the old arrangements or it requires a totally new system, procedure and legal framework? The legal framework that exists today does not qualify all the existing Kachyabadis to be regularized today. I think first we need to very seriously sit and document all the Kachyabadis and also not just Kachyabadis, but also the ex existing villages in and around Karachi. And after that, there needs to be a sort of commission or a proper uh, authority which undertakes the regularization of these Kachyabadis. Otherwise, believe me, the number of Kachyabadis that have been organized, or rather the number of homes that have been organized, um, regularized in Kachyabadis up till now, there has been a massive corruption and huge and in a massive number, like the amount of money that has gone into, you know, the, that has generated in the last two, three years only, especially in Orangi, the way the German school ground has been allotted. And, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's massive leakages, corruption in the system, which needs to be, you know, a people who live in Kachyabadis should be regularized, but the, the, the slogan of Kachyabadi should not continue to be used by corrupt officials for making the kind of money that they have been making, not during the last 20, 30 years, as recent as last year, this year, and the year before. So my next question to Arif Sab again is that about half a century ago, the residents of unplanned settlements had hope and promise for improving their lives and the built environment. But what we find today is completely different. Today's emerging settlements do not display the same situation. Why do you think we have reached to that point? I think there are a number of reasons for that. In the 70s, 80s, even in the early 90s, Kachi Abadis were a priority, not only in Pakistan, but all over the world. Need for regularization was something that was 
it was felt that that was the only solution that there was. And it was also backed by a lot of international funds, also by new ideas of community participation uh, of, and the taking over of a lot of facilities by the residents of the Kutiyabadis. So it was a period of uh, experimentation. It was a period of hope. And it was a, something that was backed by the political establishment. There was Bhutto's Malikana Hopu program. And after that, we had the 1975-78 Act of the Zia government. You know, we are to a great extent governed by what happens in the rest of the world. These initiatives too were political initiatives. But then the politics of your country also changed. You had uh, new new liberal thinking that emerged. And under the new thinking, subsidies were looked down upon. The whole issue became one of developing real estate to create jobs, which didn't happen, by the way. And even if it did, it did not help the poor. So a whole new world emerged of thinking. You had slogans like, it's not the business of the state to do business. You had uh, issues about uh, direct foreign investment that promoted not country Abadi development, but real estate development. And so I think the whole scenario changed. This became a, it was, this was no longer a priority in any sense. And what happened with this was, that even the, with this, with globalization especially, there was a big middle class revolution also, not revolution, but the emergence of a big middle class, which required land for its growth, for its aspirations, for its younger generation. And this, again, drew most of the finances for the development and improvement of Kachi Abadis. It took these finances to the other sector of providing homes to developers for middle income families. So it was a crisis of land availability, financial availability, absence of political priority, insistence, new dividend thinking that housing is something that we have to get through the market. And the informal market will only react to this by providing land on the extreme fringe of the city or densifying the existing, existing settlements. So all these factors uh, have made the Kachi Abadis a non-serious issue as far as development is concerned, and a very serious issue as far as an absence of housing for the lower income groups is concerned. I now switch to Fahim Saab on a very recent development that has happened in Karachi. For the past many years, some of the facts that Arif Saab was referring, there were useful plans that were prepared for the city, backed by solid facts, very useful analysis and sectoral studies, and they came up with probably very pertinent proposals in the end. But right now we see that we are made to believe that the city develops by financial packages. A very large sum of money is supposedly allocated for Karachi, about 1.1 trillion rupees. So why do you think we have switched from plans to packages and whether Karachi will ever revert back to a properly organized, goal-centered planning enterprise in the times to come or we will just keep hearing about these figures? First of all, you need to consider the environment that this uh, so-called 1.1 trillion rupee package, Karachi transformation package, was uh, sort of bestowed over Karachi. There were heavy rains. Karachi was literally falling apart, city bursting its seams. On one hand, there has been a constant acknowledgement now by the whole country, the establishment itself, that Karachi is the paymaster. It provides all the, the, the money to, um, um, to this country, to its province. On the other hand, Karachi was falling apart. So I very hastily, and I, maybe I'm all wrong, but to me, it appears that very hastily a package was sort of put together. A package put together on the basis of what was already on demand by various sectors of governance 
for Karachi. Mostly these demands were, have been created or they were on the anvil created by the bureaucracy, bureaucrats. And just to sort of show that the federal government and the province, provincial government, they're all in love with the city and they're dying to bring the city out of the death trap, not even death trap, but death trap that the city is in clutched. So, you know, a package was put together. First, the federal government and the provincial government were literally fighting who's putting it, how much, and then how much will come from World Bank, how much will come from Asian Development Bank and other loaning agencies and private-public partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. So it, to me, to be very honest, it's, it's a joke, and it's not just a joke, it's a joke in real bad taste. Secondly, when I looked at the details of this package as they started to emerge, I realized what a shameful waste of money this package is going to be. It's not going to do anything good for the city. On the other hand, it's going to waste a huge amount of taxpayers' money. First of all, I do not believe that any Karachi package can really address the problems and the, that, that, that the city is afflicted with. Karachi needs good governance. Province needs good governance. This country needs good governance. We do not see good governance at the level of federal, provincial, or local government. Now, in that said, as late Parveen Roman used to say, we don't need mega projects. We need mega uh, governance. Uh, meaning, the, if at all, the federal government and provincial government have suddenly become enamored by Karachi, then the demand, what is required, should be generated at, from the grassroots level. The, nobody, even if I've spoken to PTI, MNAs, and MPAs, I've spoken to People's Party, MPAs, MNAs, and let's not even talk about MQM, MPAs, and MNAs. But none of them seems to know that where did these demands have come from. Also, when, when you allocate, say, 92 billion rupees for K4, we must not forget that K4 was given or sort of doled out to FWO back in 2016 at a negotiated notified cost of 25.5 billion. They were supposed to complete the project in 2018. In, 2000, in, in fact, in August 2018, FWO simply stopped working on the project. You know, who asked them to stop? How did they stop? Nobody knows. And we're not even supposed to talk about it. Now, similarly, Karachi Circular Railway, we have alignment available. We have six to 70 feet width of all the loop that you need. Even if you go to, back to Jaika's study, they talk about 13.2 meters of width uh, from pole to pole. I mean, I am dead sure that we have ample alignment available today. We have, I, I actually did an article for Dawn, why KCR should cost so much. And, you know, I actually first worked on the operations. How much will the, two, the chain link fencing for the two sides of the KCR will cost? How much the, the, the rail tracks will cost? How much this rail slippers will cost everything, you know, down to remodeling and rehabilitation of the railway stations. The KT, the, when the JICA had approached KESC back in 2013, and KESC had given them the cost for the two grid stations and overhead wires, everything put together, the cost came to 14.5 billion. For 44 kilometers, it was 15.3 billion. So maybe I'm all wrong. The pro I was quoting, I mean, how should I say, half the costs. Even then, it becomes 30 billion rupees. 45. How can you possibly say that KCR will cost 400 billion rupees? Only because you, want, you are in love with mega projects, turnkey projects. One of the top Chinese manufacturers that are re replacing Kuala Lumpur's metro and light rail EMUs you are asking them to bring them their $8 million EMU here. 
it's going to cost you $2.66 billion, which will translate into $400 billion. So this 1.1 trillion rupee package is anything but a sheer waste of Pakistani taxpayers' money, not only now, but our generations to come. So, I mean, I think it's a very unfortunate the way this country is governed, the way this province is being governed, this, the way we are, governed, are being governed at the local level. And this 1.1 trillion package is not going to bring any solace or, you know, easement to the city of Karachi or its people. Thanks, Prem, sir, for a very elaborate version of this issue. But I'll take this to the issue of mega projects to Arif, sir. While there are certain types of mega projects that are not desirable at all for the city, there are indeed a few larger scale projects that are necessary to be introduced into the city. So I would request him to outline what, what are they and why is it that they are not being undertaken? Look, first, first of all, let me give a comment on what uh, Fahim Sahib has said. He is very right in what he has said. I will take this a little bit further, and I will say that this Karachi package consists of a number of programs, projects, sorry, a number of projects, seven or eight projects, and most of these projects, as a matter of fact, all of them have already been approved. And part of the provincial government's development programs, it's true that they have not been completed. And it's true there have been very long delays. And it is also true that uh, the total cost of these projects is 1,183 $1, million, and 85% of this is a loan from the World Bank. So the World Bank loan is 1,012 million US dollars. So I see this whole package in the background of this. Now, if you look at it in the sense that I put it to you, it completely changes everything about the this project. The other thing is about this cap package, the other thing is that all bank finance projects, internationally, international financial agencies finance projects, are very expensive compared to locally done projects. They can be, and especially if there's an international tender involved, they can be three or four times more expensive. So I think these are important issues that have been raised by Fahim. And this is something that the government should guarantee that we should do whatever we can ourselves. Because if you don't do whatever we can ourselves, we will certainly not develop the human resources to manage projects in the future. Every project financed by the bank has a capacity building element of, in the loan. And we pay for that capacity building. Yet, where is that capacity building? Why is it that we have not developed that capacity? On the contrary, that capacity has shrunk as modernization, innovation has increased. And this is because that capacity consists of visiting projects in other countries, good practices as they are called, and having seminars and workshops, and an introduction and consolidation of the culture associated with it. So I think this is a very important aspect that we have to consider and try and change and alter. Because without the development of human resources, we are not going to have projects that are affordable. We will depend on loans. And the worst thing about a loan is when the money finishes, the so-called donor locks the office, sells everything or gives everything that there is in the office and goes away. So that has been our history. Now, but there are projects which we desperately need. I mean, there's no doubt of it. We need a housing for our people. The reason that these buildings that are nine and 10 stories high that are built in Kachi Abadis is not because people like living in them. It's simply there is no option. 
The other option is living on the extreme edge of the city and living very inconveniently without social facilities, living with great difficulty to work, to go to the work, to your work area and come back takes hours. You spend a lot of money on that. So in an old country, Abadi, you the near the city, there is a demand for houses. And that demand is fulfilled by a building upwards. And these are informal developers that build upwards. Now, my thinking has been for a long time, and I've written about this also very often, and I've planned also around this, that can we formalize, if we cannot invest in this, as they say, there's no money. All right, there's no money. But can we formalize this process in some way or the other? I think we can. We can, and with the same developers, we can formalize it, who don't take a single penny from the government. As a matter of fact, they give large sums of bhatta to survive. And from one home, they produce about seven or eight houses, seven or eight housing units. Can we do something with this? Can we do this retrofitting? Yes. I think that's the easiest way today to guarantee a safe house to our people is the retrofitting of low-income areas, not only of Katiabati, but generally of low-income areas where the densification is taking place. It is extremely important. Otherwise, we will drive our poor out of the city as we are doing systematically. That's one thing that is very essential. The other is thing that is essential is transport. And as far as transport is concerned, we are building these very expensive uh, PRTs. They are being built. So I support them. Yes, we are building them. Let's try and make them as, as economical and as uh, useful as possible. But they're not going to solve your transport problem. And this, in a very big way, other routes are fed into them. In the areas where they are elevated, routes cannot feed into them. So what you really need for this city are buses. You need buses. You need bus depots, terminals. You need schools where transport managers are trained, where conductors are trained, where drivers are trained, where maintenance staff is trained. You need all that if you want a system to function. And in addition, you need its links with academic institutions so that the academic tuition, uh, institutions have a relationship with reality. And that reality has a relationship with formal knowledge. Now, this is the only way in which you can deal with this transport uh, uh, issue. So that's another very important aspect. The other, of course, is uh, water. And here you need massive rehabilitation of the existing water supply system, which has simply collapsed. It has not been maintained. It has not been managed. Its bulk metering system no longer exists because maintenance costs are high as, very high as compared to what is spent on maintenance. And again, you need the human resources to maintain it. And for those human resources, you need places of education for those specific uh, maintenance issues. So these two, in my opinion, are extremely important. It's not just a matter of bringing water to Karachi, no. You can bring water, but so what? How are you going to manage it? How are you going to maintain the system? How are you going to distribute it? So these are important issues, water, transport, housing. As far as the issue of drainage is concerned, I think the S3 project, if properly implemented, will bring a lot of relief to Karachi. So far, it has been extremely slow. It has taken many, many years for it to even begin being implemented. At this rate, it's not going to do much good to the people of Karachi because new problems will arise. 
if it can be dealt with in a period of five to six years, I think then we can go on to the new problems that are arising and link them up with this development. So that is, and you desperately need to open up the outlets to the sea, which are blocked. Out of five major outlets, three are almost completely blocked, completely blocked. So you can open up the, remove the so-called illegal houses from the Nadas, but what happens then? Where, where, what about the blockages? How are you going to deal with them? They are formal sector, three of them are formal sector developments at their end. So these are important issues. And then you have the circular railway. Again, extremely important. At one time, we were of, of the opinion that the circular railway should be built and spurs should be built into Urangi, spurs should be built into Valdias, the, the Kurangi Randi loop should be completed. I feel myself that perhaps that would have been a better situation. Uh, I'll stop here, but there are important issues related to the things that I've mentioned. Now, regarding Gujarnada, for instance, 5,700 houses have been identified as illegal and that need to be removed. That's one Nada. Let's take all the Nadas, mm -hmm. depending on how many there are. So I think you will, in the same proportion, you will be displacing about 60,000 households. How are you going to find place for them? Where are they going to live? Where is the land going to come from? I mean, these are important questions. In my view, all these can be taken care of. There is no real shortage of land. This is a fiction that is constantly promoted. Sabinenge, no land, there is land. If anyone wants, I'll show you where the land is. Thank you, Arif sir, for a very profound comment on this matter. Uh, Arif sir, identified many important challenges that the city faces. And one such challenge is the political reality of Karachi. Fahim sir, Karachi, is about one third of Sindh, but it has a very strange relationship with the province. And many political analysts are of the view that in order to have a stable governance mechanism, the relationship between Karachi and Sindh has to be straightened out. What do you think of this anomaly? No, the thing is that Karachi doesn't have an anomalous relationship with Sindh. Yes, with the Sindh, Sindh's rulers, yeah, but not with Sindh as a province. Karachi is very much part and parcel of Sindh province. And to me, it's extremely homogenous. There is two-way dependence. There is a two-way, and there is there's a lot that Karachi and rest of Sindh supplement to each other. However, when you have a unfortunately for me to say, not even a mere feudalistic mindset, a feudalistic come completely corrupt and lawless mindset, then you see the problems that you see between Karachi and Sin. Karachi has the capacity to contribute to, to being the port city, being the industrial city, being you know, a cosmopolitan, metropolitan city to add a lot of good to the rest of the province. That doesn't mean the rest of the province is somehow dependent upon Karachi alone. I constantly keep on saying that we should, I mean, the, the governance model for the province and to a degree for the rest of the country as well should be when you, where you empower where you empower our towns. Now, if you look at, we, we talk about motor vehicle tax. You go to Hyderabad, Sakhar, Larkana, Nawabsha, everywhere, you will find cars registered in Karachi flying regularly in these cities. Nobody is encourages that once the car has been bought in Karachi, it goes to another city, should be registered in that city. I mean, you will find Water tankers registered in Las Bela, flying on Karachi's streets. 
so the failure which pitches karachi and rest of the sindh is basically the failure of the governance it's not the failure of people living in karachi versus people living in sindh karachi there is very high urban literacy in karachi it's it's very difficult for somebody either from karachi or any other part of the province who is not properly equipped trained or educated to start ruling karachi city we have a chief minister who is adequately trained and educated unfortunately most of the other ministers and people working in the political government and also with the bureaucracy supporting the elected leadership is extremely and i would say in poor taste so until and unless karachi is allowed to develop as a mega metropolitan corporation where all parts of karachi are are integrated into one city and i completely agree with arif sahab when he says there is ample amount of land available in and around karachi we my at times because i've been the administrator and obviously not trained into urban planning and social sciences that the way arif sahab has been but uh, i find that kachi abadi becomes a excuse for our our ruling elite as well as our bureaucracy to 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 condemn people in kachi abadis to continue suffering in the nalas in the worst form or conditions possible for human existence i think the way our kachi abadis are organized today or rather condemned today it takes away the responsibility that our ruling elite or the government or the local bodies or local authorities have to provide low cost housing to our people you know proper grounds proper i mean i mean it's it's very very painful if you go into these and I, as i earlier said i just today i was looking at the amount of money that have been generated and assimilated by corrupt elements especially of project directorate orangi town in last 2 3 years it's to the tune of more than 20 billion rupees i will try and document all that and put it in a newspaper article as well but the the thing is until this as arif sab says these kachi abadis and these low cost housing is retrof- retrofitted into decent living localities live colonies you know our people will suffer and and they will continue to be you know go areas uh, as per say for the law enforcement agency that bad word law enforcement agency for even you know police going after common criminals you know so the, this i mean we we as uh, at the end of the day the crisis to me is of the governance and until this we come back to a decent governance model these problems that you're talking about will continue to perpetuate arif sir i take take this question to you in a different way there is a very interesting perception kept by some people that whenever we had military governments in the country in retrospect karachi was able to fare better do you agree with that perception no i don't agree with that perception at all you know, there are many aspects that come together when you talk of development one is politics the other is social aspects sociological development which includes culture there is the physical aspects of development the military governments all of them in political terms have been absolute disasters they have violated the constitution made amendments that became very problematic in governing the country equitably equitably that has resulted this has resulted in major anger major political movements against the state 
An example is East Pakistan. So I don't agree. In sociological terms, the, both the IU government and the Ziaul Haq government introduced a culture of suppression where they introduced a culture in which dissent was not tolerated, especially in the case of Zia. They introduced a culture where culture was not tolerated, whether it was folk culture or vernacular culture. They banned student activities on every front, whether it was sports or they were cultural activities or they were political activities. They marginalized the youth from development. And that became the nature of the Pakistani state. And attempts were made by the elected governments to bring about. But this culture became so deep-rooted and it became so much a part of our psyche and the ethos of our governance systems that it could not be changed. The same applies to Musharraf, although I must say that he did introduce in his initial stages a level of liberalism. I firmly believe that without dissent, without a discussion, without a disagreement leading to a consensus, you cannot develop. And our military governments denied us all this. So I do not agree with this at all. Yes, there were elections at that time under military government because they needed some form of representative systems of governance to legitimize their rule. So this is how I think, and I think, and the way I'm thinking is something similar to the way in which millions of Pakistanis all over the country think. Thank you, Arif sir. I now take this discussion to another important dimension, and that is about the institutional arrangements that exist for managing Karachi's affairs. It is often believed that the institutions that we have for delivering very important services, such as water supply, sanitation, municipal management, supply of land development. Most of these institutions were in fact developed with a certain type of approach, with a certain type of mindset. And they also had a human resource supply of a particular origin. And for many, many years, these institutions have not evolved. Since Fahim Saab has worked with KMC for a substantial period of time and has very closely observed the other institutions such as the Karachi and Malir and Liari Development Authorities and the Water and Sewerage Board and several others. Do you think that, Paim Saab, do you think that these institutions require a firm shakeup in order to shoulder the responsibilities and challenges of the 21st century? I have a very strange personal experience on this. When I was appointed as administrator back in 94, I actually assumed or believed that the whole KMC, Karachi Water and Sewerage Board, Karachi Building Control Authority, all these institutions were firmly in grip of MQ. Not only firmly in grip of MQ, but also people working there were all MQ loyalists. To some extent, at some very senior level or on some specific level, it was true. But once I started working with with these people, I mean, I still remember the KMC, the five DMCs at that time, to board building control, there were like 63,000 people employed there. So my, when I started working with them, I realized it did not matter who had them, who sort of gave them the job and who appointed them in those jobs. Now they were, they were part of municipal services and all that mattered to them was to A, protect their job and B, to deliver or sort of excel so that they can cure the promotions and all that. The only thing is when I was the administrator, I, I may have been, the, been appointed by the prime minister at that time, but I did not really represent one political party or the other. So their attitude, the people who were working with me, 
their attitude was very fair. I mean, at times I crucified the sector in charges or unit in charges, but there was nobody who sort of turned back and retorted or retaliated on the basis of their political affiliations, etc. Unfortunate, unfortunately, over the years, what we have done is we have developed a culture of political patronage. And we have tried to, instead of, I mean, what about the, all the axioms or the, you know, people who were, in, they were either civil engineers, they were mechanical electrical engineers, they were from Karachi University, and they were from Anadi, they were from Meran Engineering University. They were basically, or Daud College at that time, but they were basically trained at some institution. What they needed was better training in their job. That commitment to develop their faculties or trainings were, was lacking by these institutions. People who were working in KMC, I'd never felt challenged by either MQM or Hakiki or People's Party or as per se, Jamaat Islami or any political party. My, I, it is my firm conviction that if we provide on job trainings, on job facilities, and bring, try to bring the existing employees and the, the, and the, the workforce in these institutions, I think we can very adequately enter the 21st century. If we continue to sort of lag behind, drag, and continue to uh, uh, employ and apply corrupt means, we shun merit, and the, 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 remember, the, the, these young men or women who have been employed by these institutions are all young men and women of this province and this city. They're all very bright people. They're not dumb. So, you know, the, but the thing is, instead of sort of going for a witch hunt or political victimization, we need to own this institution. I mean, the local council services are the, the weakest and the the most condemned of all the condemned civil services in Pakistan. The, the DNG or the Pakistan Administrative Services, the Provincial Administrative Services, they ride over local council employees like anything. So that, I mean, prejudice or bias should be shunned. And the, the people who are there, they should be, allowed. I mean, you, you cannot imagine the amount of prejudice and bias and victimization is faced by these so, I mean, what does that do for the morale of these employees? So we need to build their mor morale and we need to offer and we need to bring in young people, better trained people, you know, finance, business, graduates. I mean, all, all the, the best we have in the society, we must bring in, but we must also try to utilize what we have. And I think we have an adequate workforce. Thank you, Fahim sir, for a very appropriate comment. I now switch to Arif sir on something related, something similar. Often the common people associate enormous amount of hope with the civil society. And they believe that many of the challenges that the city faces can be at least partially addressed by the institutions of the civil society. Do you really agree that the civil society institutions in the city have the capacity to deal with the challenges that the citizens face here? When I started working, there was no such thing as civil society. There was no such thing as an NGO. They didn't exist. These things evolved, as you know, and were given great support when major changes took place in the global economy. When structured adjustment took place, these were the safety valves through which the poor would be served and funds were arranged for them. But somehow the safety guys have not worked. And they have not worked because civil society organizations can do excellent jobs, there's no doubt of it, in the area in which they are working. But the issue is so large, so huge, all these issues, especially education and health, that civil society organizations, even if they come together, they are not able to even tackle a small percentage of the issue. So civil, they can develop models, yes, in a specific area. They can change those models into research and training institutions where others can come and get trained, but they cannot solve the problems. 
this is something that the state alone can manage. And I don't even think, although my good friends, many good friends disagree with this, I don't even think that the participation, public-private participation model can be successful. All these issues, these things, even the private sector, they require regulation. They need to be regulated, regulated by a neutral body whose job it is to protect the interests of the people from this whole sort of development. For instance, when I look at the education se sector, there are seven systems of schools at present, some financed by improvements financed by the bank, some financed by USA, the DFID program, and all fiercely independent. I would have preferred if all these came together to fight for a reform in the state's education sector. And this huge amount of money that is spent on creating islands, which don't grow, but eventually get swallowed up by this sea of chaos, I would like to see them consolidated throughout the province. So that's how I look at civil society. I don't doubt it's niyat, as they say in Urdu. I don't doubt its uh, capacity either to develop programs and projects, but I do not think that they are the solution to the issues that we live with. That I feel strongly that only the state can manage, or this, if it not manage, then organize and regulate. I think this is an important job of the state. I think Fahim Saab also touched upon a very important thing, and that was the training of people. The evaluator of the Karachi Development Plan 2000 from the UN side, this was 1989. 10 years later, I was a member of the KDA board. In these 10 years, the KDA had disappeared. The planners were gone. Monitoring was gone, documentation was gone, working on a organized plan that had been developed, that was gone. All that had disappeared. To, find, to pay people's salaries, it had become common to sell land. If there's no money, all right, sell some land, get some money, pay the salaries. Now we had reached that stage by 19. And this happened to all the organizations. And young people left, who were, I can tell you of planners who went away. They are now in Montreal, they are now in, in Toronto, they are in Australia, they are in the UK, working in local government. So this, and why did they go? Because they had nothing to do. They didn't see a career ahead of them. Large scale corruption of every kind. It was for these reasons that for developing human resources that in the Bhutto era, a municipal training institute had been established. And the job of that municipal training institute was to develop a culture of continuous learning within the various departments of governance or on urban issues. Well, it no longer exists. It, it disappeared. Uh, I think it was 1984 that it disappeared or 82, I don't remember, and didn't appear for a long, long time. And when it did reappear, there was no one to teach there, and there was no one to come and study there either. I don't know what the situation is now. But such an institution is extremely important for any governance systems, continuous evolution and development. The courses at NEPA, what used to be NEPA and Staff College, are not alternatives to this. They are a part of a larger course. Whereas over here, the courses were going to be specific to urban issues, and this research was supposed to be specific to urban issues also. Without these institutions, the very important issues that have been raised here, I think, cannot be tackled. We cannot move ahead without 
such an institution. And the other cities of Sindh are no better than Karachi. As a matter of fact, they are much worse. They also need this. Whether in Karachi or one in Sakhar or one in Narakana or whatever. I mean, these are details. But the necessity of this is paramount. And the other issue, of course, is that on the basis of this, can our politicians take informed decisions? I think if they cannot, if they cannot inculcate this, then I'm afraid there is very little hope for a quick solution to the problem of human resources. Then it will come only through concerted efforts in a period of time, maybe 10 years, maybe 20, maybe seven, I cannot say. Thank you, Arif, sir. Just to update you that the building of the Municipal Research and Training Institute does exist, but it is taken up by some courts and it is in, in a very poor state. I mean, we have seen it as a thriving institution, but it is a very uh, sorry state in the present times. Maria had to add a comment. Maria, please go ahead. Well, first of all, I would like to apologize. We lost Iftikhar Sharwani. He's been called up in a meeting, he's on the road and we are trying to connect as he gets free. There are many questions coming up from the audience. We are live on Facebook and of course on Zoom as well. And this goes to all of you, including Noman as well. So I, the current flooding that we have witnessed in Karachi and with all that we have heard from you in detail as to the problems that afflict Karachi, what would you like to say are the remedies or any way forward to actually control the flooding next time, in the next rain, in the next monsoon? Any, any one of you who would like to comment? Let's start with Fahim because he lives in an afflicted area. <laughs> Allow me to add in Urdu, Dua Kare, let's pray. Because uh, the way things are today, I don't see any remedy in short term or even medium term. The Nalas, the stormwater drains are in real dire situation. The Soldier Bazaar Nala that passes through under Ziauddin Road, as it turns behind um, Jinnah courts, it's merely 10 or 12 feet wide. Now, tons and tons of water coming from all over the city suddenly and it's just just an example. And everybody is talking about Guja Nala, so I thought just add, you know, a glorified Nala as well. So I I see very little hope. I mean, a lot of my friends who are environmentalists, they say what you have seen is one off event. This is not climate change that you are looking at. Climate change, you know, is going to be Etc. But I firmly believe that we're witnessing major climate change in our region. Just look at the this year's rains or December's winters or two heat waves prior to that. I think these rains are going to be a frequent event. The city will continue to flood and KWSB only knows one way to dewater and that is through pumps and no pumps on this face of the, world, of the earth can dewater the tons and in the billions of gallons of water that pours down. So I very, I'm sorry, but I really don't see a hope of any address to the problem in short term period. Arif sir, would you like to add? Yes, uh, no. I can add something, although I think it's you who should add really, but I will add something. I agree with him that yes, it is not going to be easy to manage this. My own view is that which I have expressed in writing as well, there has to be a short term plan, a very short term plan. And that has to be simply to begin with, to map the choking points of these nalas, just the choking points, leave the rest. Don't touch it, choking points. Wherever the choking points are, you open up those choking points. That's one step that needs to be taken. Second, wherever there are major barriers to the flow of water from the Kirtar ranges to the sea, those barriers should be removed. The advantage of where the outfalls to the sea are stopping water, 
those outfalls should be addressed instead of all these nalas addressed together. This can be done very fast and will help enormously in reducing the pressure of water on the nalas and on these settlements. The second thing that needs to be done is the opening up of various roads and having culverts made through them. The roads are higher than the bastis. Consequently, the bastis get flooded with road with water, complete, completely submerged, and there is no outlet for that water. We get islands of water surrounded by roads. This has to be addressed. Third, we should undertake a building of dams on all the major nalas at their source and on Liari, on the Liari and Mari rivers and on the Mool rivers. This was one of the recommendations of the Karate Strategic Plan 2020, but that did not take place except in two cases. This would help. Now, after that, you will have to have a long-term program of slowly retrofitting the set settlements along the Nalas so that they can be saved from flooding. I do not believe in their large scale demolitions. And I don't, my personally, I don't even think it is necessary, but I'm not sure. One would be sure if these Nalas are properly mapped, but apart from the mapping of the Urangi pilot project that was done in 1997, it's very old. There are no Nala mapping, no Nala mappings that have been done in a systematic way. Although I hear now that contracts have been given to consultants to do this job. Consultants, unfortunately, cannot do this job unless they are constantly in touch with the local population because the local population knows better than anyone else why it floods, where it floods from, where the blockages are, and it has to involve them. The point is, who is going to do this? That is big question mark. And who is going to then, in a period of 10 to 15 years, slowly adopt a system whereby these nalas, once they have been cleared, once they can flow properly, who is going to maintain them? Who is going to add to them where necessary? as by through a system of monitoring. You are going to close some of them, again, by a system of monitoring. So that has to be a continuous affair. Now I come to another very important point, and that again is a long-term solution. All buildings in Karachi, all housing estates in Karachi, all development gated developments in Karachi, their whole drainage system goes and empties itself on the road in front of them. So the road receives all this water. And once the water comes onto the road, it has to find a place to go. So wherever there is a, a gradient, the water flows in that direction. And that is why these streets, they turn into rivers. So you will have to incrementally build a drainage system. Right now, it goes onto the road and it, or on into the, into the sewage system, creating immense pollution and disease. So that is the other aspect that you will have to look into. Again, it cannot be done in a year or two years. It will have to be done slowly and incrementally. Now they have built these new roads. And I was told with great pride by one of the contractors that, look, these roads, no water was accumulated on them. So I asked him, I said, but where did all the water go? It must have come, but where did it go? So he laughed. I said, you know, it went into the settlements on either side because the road is much higher than these settlements. So there are loads of these issues 
these are teething issues. There were teething issues for this, these settlements and for the city as a whole. We ignored them. We found, found the easy way out of these issues. Well, it's no longer possible for us to find the easy way out. Research and a slow incremental plan. Can I add something, please? Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, in 1995, Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister of Pakistan issued a Prime Minister's Directive stating that in future, all roads built or rehabilitated in Karachi will have non-destructive road crossings and util util utility tunnels slash stormwater drains along these roads. That was 1995. The, the Prime Minister's Directive, I remember, was produced before or presented before Public Services Coordination Board which was chaired, then chaired by Chief Secretary Sen, and all the land-owning agencies in Karachi, including Cantonment Board, KMC, KDA, Government of Sen, all 26, 28 of them, Navy, Air Force. So everybody was there, and everybody accepted it, and you know it was kind of duly incorporated in their rules, bylaws, whatever. Not one road since then has has been developed, which has either a non-destructive road crossing, utility tunnel, or a stormwater drain. So what Arif Saab is saying, I completely agree with him, uh, that this is what needs to be done, but not in, 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 on the 27th August or 28th of August um, rains. I was driving from defense towards my office near Aichandigar Road. And with this Lily Road Nala, passes under Chaudhary Khalifa Zaman Road, just, in, in the, in, in the, just at the edge of the Clifton flyover, for days and days, there was two, and two, two and a half feet of water is not, is stagnating there, and nobody was even willing to, to drill a hole so that water can sort of drain into the Nala. So the, the level of political will the level of municipal governance is in such dire needs that what, what Arif Saab is saying is what needs to be done. But the, if you ask me today, Arif Saab is talking about a year or two. I mean, I, I do not ha see this happening in, year, year, in even next five or 10 years because we have miserably failed in doing basic, you know, or rather take basic actions which are required. It is, Rahim Sahib, it is true that these directions were issued. And I would be kinder to them than you are, by the way, well, because you know them better, I suppose. But you know, the new roads that they have built and the new flyovers they have built all have drains on their sides. They have been, and they are good drains. But the problem is, where does the water go to? The water has to go somewhere. It can't just throw in a drain and stop where the road stops. So they have followed the directions, but it's not of any use unless you have a point where you dispose. So that is not there. So after a small journey in the, in the drain, then Sir, also the drain that was built along Allama Iqbal Road, Clifton, from Clifton Bridge to Clifton Underpass, the gradient or the slope was all wrong. Instead of flowing towards the drain, either the Lily Road Nala, you know, near uh, Clifton Bridge, it, 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 you, you can, can completely right. And, you know, it, it's so, I mean, I, I, I don't want to sort of, but, you know, Somebody asked, once asked me, when does it hurt? And I, my response was, only when I laugh. <laughs> yeah. Roman, we would like to hear your views also before I go to the next question. Because I believe there have been uh, immense studies from NED as well and from your end on the precarious condition that Karachi witnessed during the flooding. So we would really like to hear from you. There was one, one dimension that I would like to add, that is about 
the quantity of water that was generated during this past spell of rain and some of my students from civil engineering they were able to do an assessment and they were they brought in some very interesting empirical findings majority of our roads in the dha they generated what in engineering is called as a dam spill effect meaning that the amount of water that accumulated and that was flowing down almost followed the same pattern as the spillway of a dam behaves in a usual situation which means that since there was no outlet there was no other format there was no other possibility of that water to go away it created that type of a strength and that type of hydraulic pressure which caused all the damage that we all are very familiar with so for undertaking a retrofitting they came up with various interesting answers and one of the answers was to reduce the scale of the asphalted spaces and also in fact create options of groundwater recharge alongside there was a very interesting finally a project that an engineering student did very innovative in which he said that instead of coming up with a conventional hard surface pavements if we can come up with a combination of asphalted and probably open ground option for road shoulders just by introducing this surface this type of a combination on all of major roads enormous amount of in fact relief can be obtained and he was able to prove that by way of hydraulic modeling so i think many interesting solutions both in respect to replanning as well as retrofitting lie but then we also need to apply them somewhere and and test them out and for that we need certain type of support from the municipal agencies as to how to go about it we remember that about 10 12 years ago when there was a similar episode of rains there was a retrofitting of streets done in defense but it has i believe turned into a nightmare where you see the center of the road turn into a strange type of a surface which is good enough to tear away the the tires of the cars and that certainly has little effect. effect on the the runoff of the dead water i believe we have many many more questions and we are running out of time so maria go ahead yes so i mean in continuation with the subject that we are dwelling on there is a question which asks uh, specific to arif saab ke arif so how do we control the slum development which is so prevalent on the nala areas and whose fault is this what's the root cause look the root cause first i think the root cause is important formal sector housing and land is unaffordable to your people it is also unaffordable even to the lower middle class but somehow they put something together and managed to get a plot so you have these areas which no one wants and these areas are occupied by those who have no other option by the way to try and understand which is something that is not understood nobody wants to live in a kachi abadi nobody wants to live under continual insecurity so it's not by choice that these settlements are made it is out of necessity how do you deal with them i have already mentioned that before you touch all of them and start widening the nalas you remove the pressure points and deal only with the pressure points and see how you can manage this and after that you can retrofit these settlements you can retrofit them from being single story houses to four or five story buildings we've done a lot of work on this and seen how it can be done and in that process you can remove these settlements from the edge of the nalas and you can secure the edges securing the edges is very important you can secure them either through retaining walls you can secure them through stone pitching at an angle but whatever you do you will need to prevent solid waste being thrown into them you will need to present prevent sewage from entering them and the model for doing that preventing sewage is there that is the store that is the trunk sewer in the bed of the nala as is being done in liari right now there is no other solution to it i feel we can densify the settlements in a more humane manner than they are today and i don't believe in demolishing them and doing it i believe in doing them in bits and pieces under a larger plan with by the way with love and affection for the people who live there yaar mohabbat bagair nahi ho sakta theek tarah se
So how do we initiate this process and who initiates this process? This is a social conundrum that we are looking at. And I mean, where does the task force for such eviction, rehabilitation comes from? You know, who spearheads it? Is it the government, the people, the citizens? How do we go about it? A university or a group of universities make a proposal with some uh, professionals and take it to the government, government. Let's say, you say that along the upper reaches of the Uranginala, we would like to sort out housing. Let's make a plan with the consent of the people, with discussions with them, carry out a small demo. If the demo works, I think it will work. Let's expand it into a big project. We have these in the federal government's uh, plan, you have also 12,000 flats. If we are building 12,000 flats, probably we can have 48,000 houses developed out of uh, retrofitting. That's possible. So I think uh, without working on it, in fact, you can't begin this. And if you do this today, maybe in the next five to six months, you have a model which you can then start expanding. And who's going to do it? You have a an administrator, you have a commissioner, they will do it. They will initiate it if they agree with it. And if they don't go to the World Bank for a loan, and with the loan will come consultants who have grand ideas. But without a debate and without a plan and a model, I don't think we should just begin it like that. It is unfortunate that we lost the administrator in the very beginning and he was unable to participate. I think that this was a question or a dialogue that had uh, could have had many meaningful you know directions directives leading to it i have a question before we sign off which i think is very important so during the course of our talk there was a mention interesting mention of how karachi has been very important for the federal and the provincial government and how people have amassed wealth from the city itself and all of that so what what is how come that no master plan of karachi was actually ever concluded and what is the vision of karachi i mean where is it that the vision of karachi lacks its implementation to all of you including noman as well i can start off by mentioning that the planning process that you are referring to that prepared that generated several visions I just mentioned two important plans that the city had. One of them was prepared in the 1970s. And that plan was a very balanced plan because it tried to establish a relationship of the city with its vast hinterland that was called as the planning region. And in that, the type of habitat, the type of livelihood activities, agriculture, and other types of ecological assets, they were all identified to be conserved, promoted, and in fact, enhanced in their overall output. The idea was that if the city would have a green hinterland, would be able to contribute to the lifestyle of the people of the city. Unfortunately, it built upon the premise that the state would be the financing entity for that plan, which was never to be. And obviously, after the regime change, that plan simply lost its way, although many components of that plan were eventually implemented and much of the city that we see is basically an outcome of that plan. The other plan that we had for the city tried to map the land resources amongst the other contribution. This was a plan that Arif Sir was mentioning, he evaluated. In that plan, they identified that around 19, late 1980s, the city had vast swaths of unutilized land. And the plan came up with various scenarios. And one of the scenario was to have an appropriate infill in order to economize on the infrastructural investments that were made for the city. In many ways, the fundamental thinking of that plan is still valid because we have many underutilized and completely unutilized parcels of land at strategic locations, which can provide for many, many essential functions and Possibly one of the ways of making Karachi more efficient and livable is to fix its metropolitan boundaries. If it is going to grow and expand into its jurisdiction and territory, 
the service delivery to its residents, the cost of laying that infrastructure, and the overall management would become simply an, an, a kind of an economic nightmare. So in my view, the city must have metropolitan boundaries as most of the plans suggested and try to utilize the available land resources within them to make the city compact of reasonable density standards and also possessing reasonable, I would say, systems of public spaces which could remain accessible to all the categories, all the stakeholders, all the interest groups that the city has. Arif Saab can certainly add to it. Well, as far as the regional aspect is concerned, the region has already been planned, in my opinion. You look at the, used to be known as the superhighway. All the way to Hyderabad, you have now townships. You have housing, you have industrialization, you have the corridor, and you have huge settlements that are coming up. And all this area was a very ecologically sensitive area. You take a look at the National Highway, right up to Garo is already planned and expanding on both sides of the National. On the RCD Highway, beyond Las Bela now, you have developments. You have a lot of defense development and you have a lot of uh, industrial development. So many of these areas where these developments are taking place were protected areas in the 1975-85 plan. So to a very great extent, these decisions have already been taken. And unfortunately, all these three areas are very sensitive ecologically. So that's unfortunate. The other aspect, I think, about the planning issue has been that these plans did not have any backing by the people of Karachi. They did not even know that these plans were being made. They did not even know what these plans meant to their lives. These were done in bureaucratic, technocratic setups without talking to the people, without involving them, not even a public presentation of any of these plans was made where people could go and look at them, comment on them. There were a lot of projects in this, for example, the coastal projects, which influenced the lives of the fishermen and aquatic life also. Nobody knew about it. So this aspect of public support for a plan that might have led to the plans becoming law never happened. And I think today we are making exactly the same mistake. The only difference is that now we have both academic institutions as well as a lot of NGOs and research organizations and community organizations who voice their opinions. How this can become a part of the planning process, I think is a great challenge for us in the future. Ahim, would you like to add on to it? Just a little bit. You cannot see Karachi in isolation. You have to see Karachi in context of Sindh as province, as well as Pakistan as a country. If you really want to see any of the benefits of what Arif Saab is saying, or Naman Saab is saying, the state will have to decide to become pro-people. It cannot continue to exist in its present form. And you expect Karachi to somehow deliver for its people. Neither you can have a meaningful master plan or its uh, city's resource planning until this the masters in Islamabad and Pindi or their doubts down in Karachi acting the way they continue to act for last so many years. Poor Karachi can do miracles, but unfortunately, I don't see any of those miracles taking place anytime soon. Interesting, Fahim, your thoughts on this. This actually leads to the question that a lot of people are asking is, so who owns Karachi? When we talk about the vision of Karachi, we try to ape Dubai and we try to ape Singapore. Why can't Karachi be just Karachi and the vision be just Karachi itself? So who owns Karachi and who can bring about uh, this masterful change of Karachi being Karachi? 
I believe that the people of Karachi and many invisible stakeholders who may not even exist in the sphere of Pakistan, they own Karachi and they have high stakes. Of late, we hear a lot about the overseas Pakistanis. They have huge stakes. Anything that happens in Bahria town creates a kind of a, an, an uproar in the circles of overseas Pakistanis because they see Karachi as uh, a kind of a gold bowl of investment. So one, one thing that we need to learn about Karachi, like other cities across the world, is that, that there is a whole range of overt and covert stakeholders. And as such, like other cities, the interests, conflict of interest and combination of interests of such stakeholders come up with uh, the various interventions that the city faces. In some cases, the, these enterprises are visible and these linkages appear on the map very at, at the, in the starting stage of the whole work. But in some cases, these uh, type of associations, these type of uh, collusions, they happen behind the scene. But uh, obviously, at a fair assessment of Karachi will be that who are these stakeholders? What are their interests? What are their yes. common interests? And what is the ground where some kind of a consensus between them and the common citizens can be, in fact, established? So far, that, that uh, platform of consensus building is absent. Primarily, such type of tasks are performed by the town hall, but town hall appears to be anachronistic to Karachi's uh, affairs. So let's see that at some point in time, we do have a platform where many of these uh, I would say power struggles to take control of Karachi's affairs, they become more visible and the people are able to have a greater participation in them. Arif Sahib, would like to have something to say no, here? No, I, I quite agree with you. Karachi is really a global city. They have very powerful global and regional interests in it. And with them, they are the local collaborators in those interests. No, I agree with you completely. Ahim sir, would you like to add? I wish I did not, but uh, okay. I think the last people who own Karachi, uh, and they should, but are the actually people of Karachi. Karachi is, uh, is an entity which is being violated left, right, and center by forces who have no stake in Karachi. The forces and that you talk about who have interest in Karachi, in, in its investment, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, they, they are there. But unfortunately, the reins of Karachi or ownership of Karachi, until this, it is devolved to its people. And that can only happen through a mega metropolitan corporation of Karachi, where Arif Saab, you and others can also play their role. Karachi will continue to be violated by undemocratic, corrupt, and similar forces. And the people of Karachi will continue to suffer. I, to be very honest, do not uh, foresee any hope in new, near future for something like that to happen. Because the larger forces in this country, and this region, they're the agenda or their objective is not to provide any kind of solace to people of Karachi is how best they can use and misuse Karachi and its resources. And that's about it. Well, I see that some kind of a directive has been, um, you know, outlined and which is great. I seriously wish that if the Shalwani was on board with us, that this talk needs to go forward to the directives to the government panels to the bureaucracy and i'm sure that amongst us are some members who can actually push this forward and i really hope that this happens because these initiatives and these dialogues are meant to be just that to propel for a cause to and and today's talk the myths of karachi is huge in itself and i think if we can take some 
some points forward in the right direction and we would have justified our, our our talk and the time that has been spent amongst the panelists our esteemed panelists i would like to thank all of you for having given us your time and to all the audience that have joined us sporadically continuously from various parts of the world as you mentioned and the karachiites who have joined us from various parts of the world thank you so much for joining us uh, thank you arif saab thank you uh, fahim zama thank you noman let's hope that we take this dialogue forward in a concrete direction and we will hope to see you all again in the very next webinar conducted on some other Im important aspect of where we live in and reside thank you so very much thank you thank you thank you, thank you all of you